We have announcements to read. <laughs> All right, uh, we have rescheduled surprisingly rockin' JavaScript and DOM programming in GWT. It will take place at 2 o'clock in room 9. Right here? This is room 9. We have also added a repeat session of under the covers at the Google App Engine, uh, under the covers of the Google App Engine data store at 3:15 in room eight next door. Uh, all sessions, excluding fireside chats, will be posted by mid next week on the Google I/O website. And please remember to fill out your evaluation form and leave it at the collection bin in the back of the room. Yeah, Where that's a big help for people to figure out just how bad our talk was. Exactly. So, hello. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. This is going to be a brief talk on Google Code's project hosting feature. And uh, we'll, well start off by talking a little bit about who we are. Well, we've, we've been working in open source together. Uh, my name is Ben. And this I'm is Fitz. Fitz. We've been working together for 10 to 12 years uh, on open source. Uh, on Apache stuff, um, we're a couple of the original uh, developers for Subversion. We wrote the Subversion uh, O'Reilly book, uh, and then we came to Google. And uh, since coming to Google, this was essentially the, the project we started out on, was writing an uh, open source project hosting feature of Google Code. So, so that brings us to who are you? Uh, <laughs> the next question is we want to know a little bit more about what you guys are up to. So how many of the people in the room are web application developers? Presumably most everyone, I would imagine, being at this conference is all about that. Uh, how many people here have used Google Code for hosted a project on it or been a member of a project on it? How many people have just participated in open source development in general? Curious. Most of you. Okay, okay that's great. Cool. So, right. well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, the general overview of our talk is we're gonna talk about why why did Google create project hosting, and then we're gonna give sort of a quick tour through all the parts in case you're not so familiar with it, and then we'll talk at the end a little bit about best practices for open source project hosting. Sure. Uh, to start with, let's talk about why Google uh, is hosting open source projects. What, what is the reasoning for this? Why are we doing this? And it, it all boils down to a very simple uh, statement, is that we're trying to get people to, we're trying to basically make it easier for engineers to write open source software together. Yep. So that's, that's the collaborative part. The other part is the open source. Open source is important to Google. It makes the ecosystem stronger and healthier, open protocols, open web, a theme that you see going through, throughout the conference. And so uh, the open source part is important here, too. We, we sometimes get requests saying, well, what if I don't want to you know, open my source up to the public? And the answer is, that's fine. You'll just have to find another hosting service. We are specifically trying to promote open source software by offering this service. And there's a lot of other open um, hosting services out there for non-open right. source software as well. Definitely. But, but that brings us to what is our philosophy for, for hosting? Uh, if, since you've used, most of you have used uh, our hosting service, it, you notice it's very different from a lot of other offerings out there, a lot of enterprise software. And it's deliberately missing a lot of uh, things. It's, it's very uh, bit pared down. You see a lot of white space on the pages. Well, one of the reasons for that is when we were starting out this project, we said, well, let's take a look at something. There are other systems out there like CollabNet or SourceForge. And those systems are really um, written with enterprise customers in mind. And they have lots and lots of switches and bells and whistles and a lot of features that, that open source projects don't really need or, or just sort of clutter up the interface. So we try to s distill it down. Right. Say, what, is just, what do open source projects need? Well, what, specifically, what do programmers need, mm -hmm. right? I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the features you see in Enterprise Project are what we call the ruling with an iron fist features that are designed to help managers manage open source projects. And they're not targeted to actually writing, not open source projects, uh, software development projects. Right, like things like reports on lines of code and who's being more productive. And, and who was the, playing foosball today at lunch. Right. And that, anyway. So, so the, we're, we're deliberately uh, pared down feature set and very Spartan is the word we like but to that, use. That also lowers the barrier to entry. And so I think that's, that's right. an important part of it. The other, the other thing we're doing here is uh, we have a theme of labels, which you see in a lot of other Google products. Um, the idea is that uh, by putting labels, it sort of gives you sort of a nice loosey-goosey way of, of attaching metadata to things, makes things very findable with our search engine. And um, what's nice about it... search engine? I, I heard we do. Okay. Um, but it's also, um, it makes it... Uh, easy to, as, as one of our developers says, it makes it easy so uh, that things that are really common are extremely easy and it's almost automatic. But if you have an exceptional case and you want to put a bizarre label on something, you can. And we're not bogged down by these, by these side exceptions. You have to do schema handle. changes, create a new exactly. checkbox, blah, 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 define exactly. a lot of things. So, and one of the ways that we that you use <coughs> uh, labels a lot is uh, to provide a way of tagging things as featured or as deprecated. And we'll, you'll see that theme covered uh, as we sort of hit each of the features of project hosting as we go through. 
The next part is, uh, is the massively scalable part, right? Google is used to doing things at scale and to handle many, many projects. So I'm, I'm very happy to say that we've, we launched uh, project hosting a little more than a year and a half ago, and we're now over 100,000 projects. And as far as uh, on an active basis every month, we're seeing activity by a little bit less than a quarter of those, but which is actually quite uh, activity being right activity. But uh, in terms of overall activity, it's a straight graph going straight up. Right. Which, is, which is really nice to see that the usage is growing and growing over time. But what's also great about it is being scalable, as our usage goes up and up, our, our latency has actually gotten better over time, which I think is sort of the definition of what it means to be scalable. Um, and that's partially true uh, because of improvements we've been making, but also because we're hosted on technology, Google technologies such as uh, Bigtable, which you might have heard Jeff Dean speak about yesterday. There are white papers about this. It's a, it's a storage system that essentially scales horizontally. You add more machines to it, it can handle more traffic, and the latency doesn't change. So that's, for example, our subversion system is based on big table. And, and, and that scalability doesn't just go across multi, adding more projects. One of our goals was that if your project suddenly gets really popular and you get uh, slash dotted, or d digged, or dug, or New York Times, or whatever it is you want to call it, reddited, um, <laughs> that you, your site doesn't fall over. Um, a, and B, the other sites around you don't fall over. So the whole goal is that, that the entire system handles the load and it, no one basically notices it. Of course, we are collaborative. Um, actually, this is, this is your anecdote, right? This is my anecdote. Uh, <laughs> this is my anecdote, it is mine. Um, we, we, we talk a lot about, uh, about handling uh, collaborative projects. One of the things that we've seen over the past uh, 10 years as open source has become uh, bigger is that someone will write a small utility or scratch a particular tiny itch and they'll put up a script or a program in a tarball or, or just a simple Python file or whatever it might be in their website. And they'll just blog about it and they'll link to it. And it'll, be, it'll just sort of sit there and rot and it doesn't have any opportunity to, to change or grow or anything like that. So we've made it so easy to create projects that, that, that you just create a project and people are dumping uh, single tiny little utilities and files in there. And that A makes it really easy if you ever want to add someone else to work on the project. But B, it also makes it really easy for people to show up and file an issue against it. Or, or send to you find a patch, your stuff. Find or, your stuff or to search. find you. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, so that's, a, that's, that's a, a small example of, of taking the very lowest barrier to entry for a collaborative software development project and giving it an opportunity to, to as a seed, grow into possibly something bigger. The other thing we're trying to do is actively promote best practices. And sometimes this is a bit controversial, sometimes it's not. But you know, there are many ways to do software development. But on our team, we have a lot of veterans uh, in software development, and specifically in open source software development. So we sort of feel like this is an opportunity for us to structure our product in such a way as to nudge users who may be new to open source software or software development in general, nudge them in the right direction that we think here's the best way based on what we've seen to do things. So for example, um, uh, an example is one of our policies across the site is we, we think users of open source software have a sort of a bill of rights in the sense that if you publish something to users like here's a release, here's a tarball, um, then that link should work forever, right? Even if you've come out with a newer version, right, and you don't want people using that newer version, you're certainly welcome to advertise the newer version, but you cannot delete that older version forever. It's part of the internet, it's part of history. Users should still be able to have that URL work years from now. And you know, some people object to that, but on the other hand, what is also we've found that it, it, it aids the open source community overall to have that kind of permanence. So, so we encourage people to deprecate. Right, things, exactly. So what we actually do is we, we, you put a label on the thing you don't want people to find easily. You just put a deprecated label. It still exists. URLs can still find it. The URL still works. But users won't see it show up in any listing unless you know, they happen to know. Unless they search they, for, in the current search. listing. We'll, we'll get exactly. to that a little bit later, too. Yep. Uh, another uh, sort of somewhat contested issue is anti-license proliferation. There's a, a somewhat of a problem here in the, in the open source world uh, that uh, engineers, uh, myself included in the past, love to talk like license stuff and work on laws. So how many people here are, are favor the GPL? Raise your hand. Okay, not a lot of GPL. How about the Apache style license, BSD, XMIC? Right, how many people don't care at all? All right, I think that <laughs> right, yes, there you go. that's what I want to see. All right, so then the Apache style people can take the one GPL guy who's here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but there, there's, we, we provide eight licenses, and that covers about 99.95% of all legal um, open source, I'd say, restrictions or, right. or, or notice or whatever you want to do. So 
we, we specifically do that because there's a lot of legal issues with dual licensing and, God forbid, triple licensing. Well, it becomes a barrier to entry, right? I'm working on an open source project. Hey, I need, I need some functionality. Oh, look, there's this other open source project that I want to use, you know, steal a component from or whatever. Oh, wait, let me look at the license. Are they compatible? Can we interoperate? Yes or no? It, it becomes a, a kind of friction between for projects to interoperate. So our feeling is, you know, every time a new corporation comes out with, with their, you know, the whatever corporate license, I mean, it, it just adds, it adds to the pool, it adds to the confusion. And now you have to wonder, well, is this compatible with all these other licenses? Right, you want to so, be this grid that just ever expanding, it, it grows exponentially right. as you continue to add licenses to so, it. So we put our foot down and said, this is what we're going to do. Right, that's how we're going to decrease the friction, is to, is to say, here, here are eight licenses. If you can't do what you want to do in one of these eight licenses, then you're doing something very weird. And well, it's something that's not open source. And it's, it's probably not open source. Or, right. probably or not. if it's, it's so strange that, that no one's going to be able to interoperate with you anyway. So. Or it's just a niche license. There's a lot of licenses we don't support that are open source licenses that, that, that comply to the OSI standard but are, have a, such a small market, per, market share of the open source world, maybe 1%. So, yep. and, and for those of you who love to talk licenses, remember the law is not logical. We have a, our resident eng lawyer on our team, an engineer slash lawyer who uh, loves it when pe people get all crazy about the fact that a license is, should logically do this. And when you hear someone say should, it involves the word law, usually you want to run away screaming. The other thing we can do with our site is you can pick and choose which features you want to use. So maybe you just want to use our bug tracker, but you've got your own website, right? Or uh, maybe you just want to use the subversion part, right? Or maybe you don't want the subversion, or maybe you're using a different version control system, that's fine. You can use everything else as a project home, but make the, the version control, you know, just point to a link off to a different version control system. We don't mind that, we think that's fine. It still helps the open source community, it still promotes open source development. So. Right. So th there's a, a lot of different ways that we're different from other hosting, um, component hosting services, in addition to these sort of general philosophical issues. We don't require approval for projects. You come and if you have a Google account, you can create a project. It's just that simple. Uh, we don't actually have any ads on the site. Uh, there's, there's, there are some people, some projects have actually requested that we allow them to put AdSense so that they can earn a little revenue from uh, eyeballs on their sites. And we've, we've talked about possibly doing that future, but uh, we, 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 we currently have a very uniform look uh, to the entire site. You, there's no way to completely reskin a page and make your uh, site look very different. We're also using labels everywhere, uh, all over the site, which you'll see when we, we start walking through the tour, um, which I think is, is a whole new way of sort of thinking about how to organize your information in terms of open source collaboration. Um, Subversion, uh, the wiki, we have a wiki feature which actually stores its version history in the Subversion repository next to your code. So your documentation and your code are, are versioned together and it makes, it makes for a very nice uh, mix. And then also, of course, we've got Google search technology built in. So you can search your code base. You can search other people's code bases. Very useful. Right. Um, so real quick, I'll give a quick overview. There's, there's a number of interesting projects that we've got on Google Code out of the you know, 100,000 or so. Uh, for those of you who have been some of the Google Web Toolkit sessions, uh, GWT, as we call it, is hosted on Google Code. They, they're a great example of how to use Google Code. They've got hundreds of issues, if not thousands of issues. They've mm -hmm. got, uh, they use the Subversion Repository. They have mailing lists where all the development takes Downloads. place. Downloads. Downloads yeah. and Wiki. And so you can see all the different stuff that they use. It, uh, MacFuse is hosted on there. Uh, jQuery hosted on uh, Google Code. A lot of people use, uh, use us to, to host their code because we're very scalable. It's a way for people to access things through Subversion, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're an iPhone fan, there's over, if you search for the iPhone label on Google Code, there's over 300 projects currently, uh, which is cool. And one of the things we've seen up, rising up a lot in the last seven months or so is gadgets. Uh, people are hosting their gadgets uh, at, on Google Code and serving the actual XML for their gadgets straight out of uh, their Subversion repository. So that they can just make a change and commit it to Subversion and users get it immediately. Mm -hmm. It's a very convenient way of, of working with your gadgets. We've also, um, most, well, a large, let's say a majority of open source projects coming out of Google end up on our project hosting site. We think we've got at least 100 Google open source projects out there. Um, we also have sort of been, you know, through whispers, sort of encouraging uh, teachers to, if they have class projects, you know, encourage their students to create their, their homework assignments or the collaborative homework assignments on Google Code, uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, and then finally, you know, as Spitz mentioned earlier, there's, uh, there's a whole trend about, um, instead of people just throwing tarballs up on their web server, They'll just go create a Google project in you know, 10 seconds. 
upload their code, put, their download, put it up as a, as a download, or put it into the Subversion repository. So there's a lot of that. Just single people who just want to share their stuff with the world. Maybe they have users, maybe they don't, but now at least it's available and searchable and findable. Um, I think what's interesting here is that um, most of our users tend to sort of be that long tail of open source, right? It's sort of like, as they say, let a million flowers bloom, and maybe one of them will be, become something great. Um, really, really large projects like Apache or Firefox or you know, Subversion, they, when a project gets big enough and popular enough, they tend to sort of want control of the server themselves. They want root, they want to do everything just to have that control. Right. And so they tend to get their own infrastructure at that point. But we certainly hope they start with us. <laughs> Maybe hope they stick with us as well. And as a result, yeah. our, our feature set caters to what we call the 80%. We really, right. we, we don't add features that, that cater to a very small percentage of people, which is something you do see in a lot of enterprise projects. Uh, and that allows us to sort of keep things clean. But let's do a little quick getting started here uh, in three easy steps to creating a project on Google Code. The first thing is you need a Google account. This could be a Gmail account, or you can actually turn any email address on the web into a quote unquote Google account. So once you have your Google account, you head over to the uh, Google Code, code.google.com. One form. One tiny there's form. one form, there's one page. You can type your project name, the summary actually, which can be the same as your project name for now if you wish, a brief description, Choose recommended so that you tell people what you're doing. Choose a license, perhaps labels if you wish, and then click Create Project. Um, that's so fast that some people do it without even realizing it. And the next step, of course, is, no. uh, pro wait, not profit, it's code, actually. <laughs> so um, the next step is to get going on writing your code and working on your project. Um, it's also useful to, to make a mailing list, though. I mean, you need to, uh, if you want to have collaborators, you need some way of communicating with them. So if you have a mailing list already, great. If you just want to mail your buddy, that's fine. Or you can go to Google Groups and create a mailing list right there on the spot and tell people to use that. A lot of projects wind up in, with a mailing list uh, for just standard discussions and IRC as well for mm -hmm. uh, faster sort of real-time discussions. Yeah. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and do a, a quick general tour of what the site looks like. We're, we'll go through some of the different features. We're not going to go through all the features because we'd like to leave some things for you to find out, and we don't want to bore you entirely to tears. <laughs> Fly through the screenshots. Fly through the screenshots. Okay. All right, so this is our front page. Look uh, at the top. You've got a description of the project. You've got some basic tabs for the different functionality of uh, your project. You've got a simple description there describing, you know, en enticing people to come participate or use your software. That's actually just a wiki page being displayed on the front there. And then we've got these bubbles on the right where it, the very first thing you see is what license this is under, which actually, you know, if you're looking around, if you're shopping around for open source projects, that's often one of the first things you want to know. And I know Fitz and I both have, you know, a lot of other situations where it, it's taken us five or ten minutes to figure out what license something is under. It's, it's, you have to, it's you very have to, annoying. If you have to check out the repository to find the license, then yeah, something's the wrong, problem. basically. But you've got the labels there for searching. And then um, at the same time, you've got things, the featured things. So um, wiki pages or downloads or uh, uh, I think those are the only two things that can be featured, right? Yes. If, if you have a particular wiki page, like a design doc, or a particular, like the latest release you want users to download, if you label them as featured, they show up right there in the bubble on the front page. So it's a very quick, quick for your users. And then below that, you can add some links, groups, blogs, et cetera. We'll cover that in the admin interface. But uh, at, and at the very bottom, you'll see a list of project owners and project members, and we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, later as well. But this is the front page. It's a very uniform style. You'll see this across all of the projects. It essentially makes it very easy for people to come and comprehend and quickly parse the screen because you're looking for things in the relatively uh, same place. Some people do get fancy. You see some other pages with like lots of screenshots, images, snazzy logos, that type of stuff. But we don't allow people to create entirely new websites from scratch. Right. I mean, they really have to conform to the style just because I think it's easier for users to understand what's going on. Right. And there's, there's a value in the conformity, I suppose. So, so that's the front page. Let's move on to the version control feature, which is a, sort of the first part here. When you, when you create a project, you get a subversion repository. It's backed by Bigtable. It has a quota of 100 megabytes, but that can be increased if you come and request on the list, hey, I need more quota for my uh, code. And um, by default, because it's an open source project, everything in the subversion repository is world readable. That's just how it is. Uh, it's not world writable, however. You have to add members to your projects, and when, then they get right access to right. the repository. And you would only add, add owners and members or people who you trust to do the right thing with your code, the sort of do no harm theory, first thing. There is no path-based authorization. So you can't give someone just access to, this is, this is another thing that's somewhat controversial, but we believe it conforms to a best practice. And that is, 
some people say, well, I want, just want to give somebody access to my docs directory, or I just want to give them access to a branch or something. And our general, the there, first thing is that it's a version control system. If you delete things, well, guess what? You can roll back and, and take those changes if someone deletes something they shouldn't. But the second thing is, since it's open source, people, you, you should only be giving access to people that you trust, okay? So if you, trust, if you don't trust someone to do the right thing, you don't want to squirrel them off into the docs area. You, want to, you shouldn't be giving them access at all. Right. So it, that also makes it easier for people to easily grow from working on one part of the code base to the rest of the well, code base. Well, this is what we talk, about. we talk about. Path-based authorization is often sort of an abused technological solution to a social problem. And one of these things we, we like to chat about and say, you know, if somebody commits something wrong, just undo it and tell them not to do it again. If they do it deliberately, <laughs> remove their commit access. Right. right? It's, not, it's not a control you really need to have technologically enforced. So, 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 the, so the default front page of the version control uh, system will show you basically how to check out and get a copy of your code. If you're a project owner, remember, it will show you HTTPS. Okay? Uh, Writes can only take place over SSL. So if you, this is a, a, a common thing where some people will check out something over HTTP and then try and do a write and it mm -hmm. fails. Uh, we, HTTP is for read only. It's, it's basically the world's way of getting at your code. Yep. And also, and so at the bottom of that top blue box, also you see that says, you know, find out what your Google code password is. We use a separate token, it's a generated password for Google code because uh, Subversion can store your password in, uh, possibly in plain text on your local machine. And we don't think that's a good idea for your Google password because your, your password for your Google account, if it's a, it may very well allow people to do things like buy stuff or get access to your Gmail right. or stuff like that. So, Yep. Well, so um, the other things you can see on the site here is uh, here's a, a simple browser. You can look through your source code and see uh, who changed things when. Just a simple tree browser. And then after that, we also have a, uh, you can flip and look through your history of commits. Um, and then if you click on a particular individual commit, you can see the, which files change and see some diffs. Um, it also does side-by-side -side diffs, but that's a little hard to get in a screenshot. It tends to be very right. wide. Um, and, and this sort of leads into code search, which is one of the things. So mm -hmm. Google Code Search is designed to sort of search for source code across the internet. However, we also, have, if, you, if you search um, in, your, in the search box here for code, it'll just search through your project. So one of the, the use cases I like to point out to people is that you want to find out how many to-dos are left in your trunk uh, release. You just type the word to-do in, and we'll automatically add the, the package to limit it to your website. And you can suddenly find all the current to-dos left in your code. Uh, Pretty it, nifty. It clearly also works for function names, et cetera. But that uh, kind of takes regular expressions, et cetera. Yep. Code search is uh, interesting to check out. And then if you, if you set up in the administrative interface, hey, I'd like to get a commit email sent out to my group, it will do that. And here's just as an example of uh, it's a standard commit email that uh, a lot of uh, subversion projects use, generated by mailer.py. And you get it uh, advertised, you know. Right. So, so that's the version control part. Let's move on to the very exciting issue tracker. Yay! <laughs> well, um, I mean, you guys have all used issue trackers before, right? So what's the first thing a typical user sees when they go to file an issue? They see a dozen little controls, right? Now, what are the chances that this user, who's you know, just using the software, that they have any idea you know, what milestone, component, priority, type? I mean, it's just Sometimes insane, I don't even right? know what operating system yeah, I'm using. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm using the computer. Yeah. <laughs> It's not a toaster. So this, this is great for, this kind of interface is great for people who are working in the project and they need to prioritize what they're doing, right? But it's not great for a typical user just coming by to file a bug. So our philosophy is, well, look, this is what a user sees on Google Code Project Hosting. You get basically one text box. There's a little bit of structure in there which you can change if you want, but it's just to help the user out, just help, help them explain the problem. And then when the project member comes back later to look at the, the bug, then they get the extra boxes at the bottom so they can do some right. labeling and prioritization and such. And it's just yeah. labels. Again, you're not going to see a whole lot of structured data here. There's a, a, a series of labels. We'll go a little bit more into some of the issue tracker labels in a minute. But uh, I want to move on to the, list, the issue tracker list. So you can take a list, like, look at all the open, open issues. You can also search for a subset of issues or even closed issues or a superset of open issues. But the one thing to draw attention to is the stars, OK? One, one of the things we saw after App Engine launched is the App Engine issue tracker just completely, someone would say, we want you to support this. And there would be 100 people saying, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. <laughs> and some of the App Engine guys were like, ah, all you have to do is click the star. And 
that will not only add you to the CC list for the issue so you can see changes upcoming to it, but it's also, it's also counted. So there's an easy way to go through in the issue list and show the number of stars, people have starred to something, and then sort by that. Right, so it doubles as a voting system, but also as a way of saying I'm interested in this issue. Possibly right. send me emails you know, every time somebody updates this issue. It lets you, lets you do both. Right. Okay. So that's the, the sort of the star power. Uh, you, can also, you can also sort by different types of headings of your issue, in your issue list, and you can also actually change this a little bit. You can, in the little dots on the very far right-hand side of the columns, you can, make, uh, you can add columns or you can remove some, some columns. So it's very fun, fairly fungible, mm -hmm. uh, depending on what your needs are for the issue tracker. And then finally, you can search at the top using standard search on labels, search on uh, whatever you want. Well, it just depends. I mean, yeah, it's, so it's what's in my next milestone? What bugs are assigned milestone? to me? What mm -hmm. uh, bugs are assigned to you, et cetera? That type exactly. of thing. Exactly. Um, this is a, the next is a screenshot of what it looks like when you're, when you're adding uh, comments to an issue. Just a simple text box or what, 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 what did Jason call it? A the teaser? Temp 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 tempting text <laughs> box. And when you click on that text box, it pops up a little more information. It pops up the label browser. It pops up, you can change the status, the owner, et cetera. Right. And when you go to change, to add or remove, la edit labels, you get this nice pop-up menu that's populated through, it's pre-populated with a number of uh, labels, but you can also change this to the administrative interface. So this is about, once again, this is about labels making common tasks possible. You don't have to come up if making common tasks to. possible? Making common Com tasks easy. Sorry, I meant easy. Uh, making common tasks easy, but not being uh, hemmed in by corner cases. If you just, you know, what it's doing essentially is it suggests you, here are some really common labels for priorities, milestones, et cetera. Uh, go ahead and use them for convenience. Or if you want to invent your own label or your own system, you're certainly welcome to do that. It will remind you, say, you're, you're using a non-common label. It non just puts a little, okay. little status in there. Yeah. So you can add any random label, go, and, and whatever. In fact, this list of, of default suggested labels is all fungible in the administrative interface. If you've got your own system, right. you can put it in there. And the last part is, uh, is, is the, the grid view. It enables you to take a sort of different view in your open issues, or I'm sorry, in your issues, period. This one is sorted up by my, columns and by milestones. So you can see what issues are 2007, 2008, uh, Q2, Q3, et cetera. It's, it's a nice way of visualizing things in sort of a spreadsheet format. Right, and you can, you can, it's very fun, but you can change that quite a bit. So that's Issue Tracker. It's very, it's very lightweight, it's very easy to use, and it's, uh, very, it's very fast, too. Well, let's take a look at the wiki real quick. Um, surprisingly, it kind of looks like the Issue Tracker. It's got, <laughs> it's got the, the uniform list. Um, it's just a list of wiki pages, usually documentation for your project, typically. And uh, when you click on uh, to go in and edit one of the wiki pages, uh, it actually is a wiki syntax, which most people are familiar with. It's sort of inspired by the Moen Moen syntax. So, uh, you've got some help on the right side of the screen that's telling you uh, what the syntax looks like, and you can expand that to get more details. And then at the bottom, you've got labels once again, so they can be searched. Uh, wiki pages can be featured, so they end up on the front page, or they can be deprecated, so they don't right. show up in that list of doc pages. So um, You can label them with a the release, whatever you like. Yep. And, and lastly, I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom. It says edit log message. By default, they, they will say, you know, it has an automatic log message, but you can also change it if you want to share a little bit of information. And why do we have this log message? Well, because if you go to your source code browser, you look and you'll see trunk tags branches, which you're very familiar with in Subversion, but you'll also see a directory called wiki, which is where all your wiki pages go. So if you're not the kind of person who likes to type into a web browser, maybe you're an Emacs or a VI person. Uh, who, who's, who's an Emacs person in the room? Emacs people? VI? <laughs> okay, fight. No, no, I'm just no. Um, but, uh, but seriously, if you don't want to sit, take time to type everything into a web box, you can just check out the whole wiki directory. You can add, you can delete files, you can do pretty much whatever you want, check things back in. With, with a normal subversion up. client. With a normal yeah. subversion client, yeah. or an abnormal subversion client. Or abnormal. So anyway, that, so that's sort of the, the wiki's uh, back-end subversion thing. It's kind of a, a neat way of handling the wiki. So it's easy to take your wiki and go as well, and mm -hmm. take it to other places and copy it around. So who, who can guess what downloads is going to look like? I wonder. I wonder Let's what it's going to look like. Oh, <laughs> hey, look it's at a that. list. <laughs> <laughs> it's a list of items with uh, little labels in green next to it. Right. So what you're not seeing here, of course, are um, this is an example of uh, Google Web Toolkit. They've just got three downloads up. They're all featured. As you can see, there's a little label there, that, which means they all show up on the front page as well. But you could, they could have had you know many older releases listed. Yeah, if it, they wanted if, to. If, with this guy, these guys, if you go to all downloads and you search for all downloads, you're going to see dozens and dozens of downloads from all their previous releases. They're all still there, but they, they just don't clutter the interface. Well, what they do is they deprecated the older ones so that they don't show up. Right. So fewer choices for their users to get confused about. 
Um, that's their own choice. So if you want to upload a new file, this is sort of what the new uh, file looks like. You'll notice that it, so you type in a brief summary, a little bit of metadata, and then you, get, you, you find the file on your local disk, and then you have some labels that, you, again, you can apply to it. But right above the labels, you'll notice that there's, uh, there's talks about the quota. This is how much you can up upload. You can upload up to 20 megabyte file at once. And, your, and how much quota you have, which is 100 megabytes. This quota is different from the subversion quota. This is right different than the, from the subversion quota, but these, these, are, these, along with the subversion quota, are all fungible. We can change all of these. Uh, all you do is request this by mailing, sending an email to the mailing list, and we'll give people more quota. The general idea is that we just want to avoid people uploading terabytes of non-open source one, things. One of the other things we did was we wanted to make it scriptable, so you could upload releases. If you have a release manager in your project, you probably have scripts that build release tarballs. We wanted that sc those scripts to also be able to upload the tarballs automatically. So right. is, we actually make a Python script available that programmatically, I think it does a post or a, a, it does a post, a post yeah. of your tarball up to the site with authentication. So, right. So that's a lot of people have integrated that. People have written ant tasks that do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that script in particular is available through the, through the support uh, project. P slash p slash support is our own Google code project where we keep our issue tracker and where we keep our little uh, upload script, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, before we move on from downloads again, you'll see a uh, very uh, popular little expandable list of labels mm -hmm. for labeling your downloads. Also changeable through your uh, administrative interface. So uh, the, uh, the, the huge news, or maybe it's not that huge, one of the things users have been asking for is, is some sort of uh, Atom feed or GData feed. Coming and we know that many users have asked for this because we had a whole ton of people star this issue, this enhanced request. Over and tracker. over. <laughs> so we, we have implemented feeds, uh, and uh, they, are, they are small and simple right now. Uh, essentially, all you need to do is, here's what the URLs look like. You can type them in right now. Um, we have feeds, two feeds available. One is a feed that will show you the latest subversion changes, uh, and the other will show you the latest for a particular project. And the, uh, the other is issue updates. So anytime somebody comments on an issue on a particular project, that will go into the feed as well. And then um, these feeds are, they are not things, uh, they're, they're read-only, they're not read-write, though we're looking into maybe making them read-write someday. Or maybe not. Uh, or maybe not. Um, they're also they're not queryable like a typical GData feed just yet. In other words, they don't uh, entirely go back into history. They go back into last week's history. They, they, they started last week essentially. So and we'd um, like to try and backfill that at some point in the future. But this is yes. This but is for, but for now, essentially, uh, if you if you were to subscribe to this feed starting now, you would see every time somebody makes an issue change or a subversion change. And uh, it's easy. You can uh, wrap these things. Like, for example, go to wait, 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 Before we oh, move on, I want to say that we can, oh. we, we'll be blogging about this um, <laughs> next week. soon next week. And you'll eventually see links, uh, feed links in your, in your, in your project. So but you're it's welcome not to a complete secret, but you can, of course, tell people about it. We don't care. <laughs> um, but uh, they, yeah. If they want to blog before we do? Right. No, it's fine. <laughs> people blog. Uh, so you can also make a gadget from the feed. This is a simple example of someone making a gadget, dropping it on their iGoogle. Uh, tab. One of the things that we found or some of our users have been doing is creating a page of gadgets of all sorts of information that their project wants to track, and they're sharing that uh, tab with uh, other, other users, uh, other developers in their project. Another interesting way of using some other technology. So now let's move on to one of the really exciting part. <laughs> oh, boy. This well, is... we, we've already talked about project owners and project members. What's the difference? The only real difference is I mean, they all have write access and can upload things and change subversion and change issues, right? Um, the difference between a, a project owner and a project member is that an owner gets access to this special tab, this administer tab, that gives them control over the project metadata. This is the only the authorization metadata. we have for yeah. the whole site, basically. It's, 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 it's either nothing, you're, you're a reader, member, or an owner, period, the end. Member and owner are the only two writing things. But Very simple. If you click on the administrator tab, which you will only see if you are an owner of a project, you get this uh, little sort of set of sub-tabs under there. And we're not going to go through all of them because we would definitely put you to sleep. But uh, we'll cover a couple of quick ones. The first one at the top has just got a little embedded wiki editor for you to edit the wiki content that shows up on the front page. This is the only wiki content not in Subversion. And there's a couple of, of reasons for that. But uh, the next thing below that is to choose your license. Again, one of eight licenses for you to choose. Add different labels to your project. If it's a Java project, you want to add Java. If it's a GWT project, GWT, you know, C++, Python, Erlang, Haskell, whatever. And this is basically filling out those bubbles on the front right. page. What, what, pro, what, what links do you think are important? What discussion groups? 
Um, you know, so it's, it's right. Just well, blogs, etc. Mm -hmm. You have a, a, a team blog, or your your, your users have blogs, uh, and at the bottom, you'll, in the middle, you'll see activity notifications. There's a way you can sort of say these are the mailing lists that we use in our projects. Um, so send subversion commits to this mailing list, send issue commits to this mailing list. When smaller projects, people will send everything, including their discussions, to a single mailing list. And if you use Google Analytics, you can enter your code down here and then track what kind of traffic your site is getting which might be tiny, it might be huge. Might, yeah. might grow eventually up and to the right. And uh, so the, the next tab is over is the project members tab. And this covers members and owners. And again, just a couple of simple boxes. You add people in there. And it will check to make sure that they have a Google account. So if you add someone who doesn't have a Google account, it will prevent you from doing that. Uh, but that's pretty, much, that's pretty much it for the the you know, sort of review of, of what Google Code Hosting do, does. There's other features we haven't discussed. We encourage you to explore around and poke uh, things and try different stuff out. But a lot of people want to know how do they move their project into Google Code. Right. So uh, first of all, we should talk about our relationship with SourceForge. And that is, they're actually our friends. We talk to them a lot. Um, one of the motivations we had for this was, hey, let's, let's, let's do our own take on project hosting. Let's try some new ideas. Let's try the label philosophy. Let's try simplifying things. And, and you know, it's also, I think it's, it, it's healthier, certainly, for the open source community not to have a single point of failure for, for all open source projects. Right. So there should be a choice about where you host things. And we actually, uh, one of the ways in which we collaborate with them is we share uh, uh, just the namespace for projects. If you come to Google Code and you try to create a project with the exact same name as something that's already on SourceForge, What's actually going to happen is you'll, you'll be denied at first. An email will be sent to the SourceForge project. You can owner. choose to send an email. It doesn't tattle on you. Right. You, can, you, you can choose Somebody's to send an email and, and, and request permission to use this project. Right. And if you're the administrator, you'll, you will hopefully get an email saying, so and so wants to use this project. Oh. Click this link to approve. If that approve. person is you. Right. If that person <laughs> is you. Or the administrator, some random person in it will get an email and say, what? Um, but uh, we also collaborate with SourceForge. Like for example, we're uh, we're doing the uh, at open Os source awards uh, at, at OSCON Community Choice lot. Awards. Yeah, we've actually we're, we, they've opened their Community Choice Choice Awards up to any open source project, not just hosted on SourceForge. Which is pretty cool. So we're pretty excited about. It. We blogged about that last week. But uh, so if you if you want to migrate stuff over from somewhere else, uh, create a new project, point it at your existing mailing lists, or create another mailing list if you want to. Import your subversion data over using SVN Sync. Well, there's two ways to do it. I mean, if you want to take all of your subversion history with you, Subversion has a, an SVN Sync replication tool that will port the history. Basically, replays all of the commits tediously into the new repository. Slowly. Um, or if you just don't really care about your history, you can just do a flat-out import of the latest tree and much, much faster. Um, I encourage you to care about your history, please. <laughs> don't delete data. Don't, don't do it, kids, really. Um, <laughs> And lastly, uh, if you have any important current release packages or anything, upload those to downloads uh, and go ahead and mark the current ones with featured and uh, you will, or the, the deprecated ones with deprecated and you can get all your download stuff in yep. there. So once you're going and you're, you're up and running, how do you maintain your project? What kind of things are you going to have to run into? It's actually pretty low overhead. We suggest that you, we have a Google group that we suggest you join where uh, project owners hang out and sort of share ideas and complain to us and complain to each other. Um, but that's also a, it's a great feedback mechanism for us. You can also go to the support project and file issues for feedback. Mm -hmm. If you have an enhancement request or find a bug, we encourage you to, to file a, an issue. If you, if you run out of quota, either downloads quota or subversion quota, that would be um, file a ticket or ask on the mailing group right. for more quota. And if you're going to just go ahead and use certain parts of it um, to, to do the a la carte thing, uh, go ahead and disable tabs or replace a tab with a link to your own content. And uh, you know, remember that this, we're not about locking people in. You can, take your, you can take your subversion data out. You can SVN sync it in. You can SVN sync it out. Uh, and we're also, one of the things we're working on is a, a way to, to get a feed of your uh, if you issues and pull those out uh, in a one well, form. we've got a feed now. I'm oh, sorry, but a way to pull out your, your, your issues in, a, in one just, format or just, Yeah, just export it to CSV or something simple like that. Right. That's we don't have an importer for issues or something because there's a whole lot of uh, issues, be, issues behind that. Issues uh, so issues. Speak. Pardon the pun. But uh, we, we're going to take a, a quick overview of best practices here. This is the last part of our talk here. Sort of <laughs> it bleeds the, into our the next tail talk. end. But we have a talk in 15 or, or 20 minutes next right. door in room 8 after this um, that actually is all about best practices for open source development. And it has the catchy name of uh, how to protect your open source project for poisonous people. But, um, but that said, we'll give you a quick preview of that and a couple of simple uh, pointers. But the first pointer being quick tip. Don't launch without running code. What we mean by that is 
um, a really common phenomenon that, le that we've seen is on SourceForge or Google Code is somebody you know, starts a project and they put up a design doc saying, we're going to write the best video game ever, blah, blah, blah. It's going to have all these great features. And, and there's no actual code. It's just kind of somebody daydreaming. You know, come on, everybody come help me. And, and if they do manage to attract people, what ends up happening is they get in the mailing list and they just kind of argue forever about what it should be and nobody actually does anything. It kind of stagnates. As opposed to the projects that I've seen that are starting out that are successful, maybe one or two people write a little bit of code, just a little bit of a skeleton. Or at the very least a design doc or something. Well, in addition to the design yeah, doc, yeah. right? And then when people come to the list, the discussion tends to be, how do we move forward from the running code that we have rather than pie in the sky, what should it be someday, right? And so I really... This is, this is a very important thing. Well, this, this all goes back 10 years ago. We, we, we worked together. We'd come in every morning. We'd go to freshmeat.net. Anybody here look at fresh meat? Okay. <laughs> and we would find what we called the whatever wear of the day. It was the <laughs> software that was released. It was 0 0.0001 pre-beta post-vapor sub-alpha whatever software that did something that 15 projects already did or no one cared about. Uh, my favorite one is we came in one day and someone actually had a, a, a GNOME version of the... Uh, yes command. Uh, it would just, it would say, it was fully localized, it would pop up a window that said the answer is yes in like 50 different languages. But whatever the case might be is, you know, you don't want to be that project. You, you want to, you want to clearly have a project that's going to uh, be useful and have some type of uh, community around it. So lowering the barrier to entry is, a, is an important thing to do to, to have a, lot a of successful ways project. Right. right, well the first thing is to have some sort of a mission know where you're going. If you, if you, if you say, we're going to do this, um, we're going to write a version control system, or we're going to write a, a tool to make it easier to do something, and you have no sort of the idea of what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, no and communicate that. Um, people are going to come in, they're going to want to do what they want to do. Hey, this guy's doing a version control system. Let's do my thing. Let's add, let's add uh, make integration and ant integration, and uh, let's have a command where you can show the, where you can rickroll people from the version control and system. it has to read your email. It has to read your email, of course. Um, the other thing you can do to lower the barrier is to have really clear documentation. Um, when people come to your project, they not only need to see a mission and a scope, they need to see, here are the docs explaining what we have, here's our coding style, here's how the components work, just because then they can get right, right away, they can start producing patches without having to harass you or, or, or drain your time and energy. Or determine if it's something they want to join in or not. And exactly. it may sound like we're talking about writing a book worth of code, comments here or documentation, but it's not. It's really, uh, this can come in a single page, but you just got to sort of give people a way to, just, to understand what's going around in your brain about what you're thinking of. Um, you should comment your code. Need comments in your code. And then um, you need a public mailing list. Right? Uh, there has to be some kind of public discussion forum, which is, has to be searchable. Has to be, the archives have to be public because you're going to get a lot of folks who come into the project and sort of don't know the history. And if they, if they took a little bit of time and read through the archives, they would know certain issues have already been resolved, why certain uh, decisions are the way they are. And you can also um, point people to that when they yeah. ask something that you Very talked important. about two months ago. Right. Having documented, it's a form of documented history. It saves a lot of time for newcomers and, right. and saves your own time as well. And if people send in patches, make sure you review them and don't just ignore them. Uh, people just want to know that they're heard in general. So if you say, I got a patch, I put it in the issue tracker, or, or file your patch in the issue tracker, that sort of thing. Uh, that's the, the base things. And the second part is culture building is tricky. Um, you know, open source projects aren't really just about the code or the license. They really are about the community of people around it, right? If, if you could throw code over a wall, and if there's nobody looking at it and there's no community, it's, it's a dead project. It may as well not exist, right? So uh, we talk a lot about community management, community building, because it is, it is the critical part. And uh, one of the things we've noticed is that most open source projects start out with one or two or three people at the most, and they have sort of their own little culture between them, maybe just between two people. Do they treat each other nicely and respectfully, or do they kind of yell at each other and posture and thump their chests? I mean, it, it, and, and what happens is, is that it tends to become a self-selecting community. Really nice people tend to attract really nice people, and angry, screaming people tend to attract more angry, screaming people. Uh, and it all starts from that little germ, right? And so be very, very careful, especially when you're a small project. Think to yourself, what kind of a culture do I want to see develop around my project? And behave in the way that you want to see other people behave. Because right. it, it spreads. And we, 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 we're big advocates of the politeness, respect, trust, humility uh, type of culture because we personally find that it is the culture of uh, so open source development, of development in general, of anything you want to do that is the most efficient. It tends to be more efficient than a bunch of people Productive. yelling and screaming and, and calling each other names all day. Well, uh, 
um, this, this leads to the next slide, I guess, right, is, is that you need to preserve your community's attention and focus. And if everybody's busy screaming at each other, or if there are no documents, or, or no people who can history, show up and distract you easily, right, then, then essentially you're going to be extremely inefficient. You might make forward progress, but only at a huge expenditure of energy. So. And we could talk about this for an hour, and in fact, we're going to in our next talk. <laughs> right next door. So you're more than welcome <laughs> to join in. But uh, uh, last thing on your way out, we've got some of our team members here. Because uh, you know, I mean, Google Code Hosting is not written by us. We have a team of uh, a number of engineers who work really diligently on this. And uh, they'll be at the door. We get some stickers that say, my other computer is a data center, because uh, we think that's kind of silly and dorky. But uh, uh, we'll also do some Q&A now as well. If you have any questions, yeah. we encourage you to come up to the microphone so that A, we can hear you, and B, that uh, folks watching the video can hear you as well. I really enjoy, um, I really enjoy your guys' um, like banter, and <laughs> your, you seem really comfortable with each other. It's really good to. We've worked together like a long time. We're like an old married couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, shut up. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, I've been to a couple of these sessions, and I've noticed, what is the significance of the letter P after, um, you know, uh, after, in the URL after? Oh, so code.google.com slash P slash project name. Well, there's, it, it's short. Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Well, it wasn't over the microphone, but ah, the question right. was, what is the significance of the letter P? Um, in some cases, there has been slash project, slash project name. So using a ZVM, which is Ben's little Z machine project we use in some of our screenshots. So you can go to code.google.com slash P projects slash ZVM or P slash ZVM. A, it's sort of a type, but B, people never seem to remember if it was project or projects. Yeah. And so by going with just yeah. the single letter. Yeah. Um, so for example, if you look, want to look at your user page, you take your Google uh, account that you've created your, your work on a project with, and you say com, .com slash you slash your username as opposed to user, or is it users? It's a disambiguation thing, and it's less, or less typing. Yeah. And, and I caught the tail end of your, um, I, I didn't catch the beginning. But correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't your issue tracker, isn't that built on um, Roundup? Is it built on what? Roundup, the open source project Roundup. Um, Roundup, no. Oh no, just it's, wondering. It's our the issue. The question is, what is our uh, issue tracker built on? And it's actually, we built it ourselves. It's based on Bigtable, just like pretty much everything else. So. Yep. Any other questions before we wrap up? All right, we'll be up here for a few more minutes. Um, hopefully, enjoy the rest of your and conference. Then we're going to go next door and talk about communities. Yeah. Thanks a lot.